Well, hello. Welcome to the Art of Re Renovation Live. I'm your host, Paul Foster from Contact Renovations and Custom Homes. And this week we're talking about landscaping. So we're going to go uh, a bit further down the rabbit hole of creating your backyard oasis. So um, a couple weeks ago we did decks and pergolas. And now we're going to get into discussions about landscaping and all things pertaining to uh, landscaping, hardscaping. That will go off onto details about retaining walls and irrigation systems and paving stone options, all that kind of stuff. So um, we will, yeah, we'll get into it because lots to consider, and we're all um, excited to get out there now and enjoy our yards and. Um, most people probably are thinking, boy, this space could be awesome. How do I make it awesome? What should I consider? So uh, my guest this week is Gordon uh, Newstater from uh, Green Tree Outdoor Living. And uh, he's a master landscape designer. So we will get him on board and uh, we'll get into the details of this. I can see they joined up. I'll pull him in now while he's, uh, well, he's on the call here. So bear with me. Wait for him to tune in, and then we'll uh, we'll get into it. And hopefully, we have the ability to show photos this week. Um, as it stands right now, I can see. Oh, hey, Gord. Hello. Oh, I better move back here. Good to see you. All right, I'm doing well. Good to see you too. All right. So I can see right off the hop that Instagram is not going to let me show pictures. So. Um, I've come up with kind of a hack, which is going to be, I'm going to flip my camera around and show pictures from another phone. The resolution is going to be terrible, but it'll at least allow us to kind of show some images in the background to help support the conversation so everyone can understand what we're up against. So my apologies right now for that, but uh, it's Instagram's fault, not mine. <laughs> Anyways, Gord, um, thanks for, for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Gonna adjust my camera a little bit here. Okay, so um, Gord, you're a master landscape designer, um, and I believe you're also the owner of Green Tree Outdoor Living. Yes. Okay. How long have you guys been in business? I've uh, so been doing it since '99. Great. Right. So it's so, been a while. A while. <laughs> yeah. So, and you guys do everything residential. I know you guys do some commercial work. I've seen you doing stuff for, I think, the city of Edmonton around as well. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've seen you out there in some public areas doing work too. Uh, right, yes. We've done, you know, um, some commercial work and, and um, done some work for the city, but we definitely specialize in residential landscape construction. Okay. Um, so you guys have noticed the um, Top Choice Award seven years in a row for top landscape contractor yes all right and the yeah. 2018 um best business of 2018 three best rated Tell yes they're actually won that one for 21 for 2021 as well oh yeah awesome recently and then we have a uh we have a showroom set up as well where you can kind of see all the different things so yeah maybe i'll turn my camera around and kind of walk around and show a few different things as we're talking sure yeah that'd be good um okay so i'm glad you have a showroom because at least you can show some images because this uh inability for me to show my photos again i have a whole bunch lined up to kind of support our conversation but we'll see how how well this works when i flip my camera but um anybody out there in viewer land if you have any questions for us um don't be shy, reach out. You'll get our undivided attention and we can talk a bit about uh, your question and, and uh, help to steer you in the right direction here. So I guess, Gord, where I usually start off um, is kind of with the plan, right? Because I think that it's really important that whatever your project is, whether it's landscaping or another renovation on the inside or whatever, the, whatever it is, you need a good plan to start, right? So um, when you get, what's what would you say is important important and key items within a landscape design when you when you first start into a client talking to a client about their project well i think the most important part is the client lifestyle like do they have kids are the kids younger are they older are they going to want to play in the backyard are they going to want to sit around a fire pit with their friends and do you entertain 
you know, during the, uh, the day, um, uh, like having friends and family over for a Sunday uh, afternoon barbecue? Or is it more like an evening thing where you'll sit outside late into the evening? And then how many people are you going to uh, invite over? Is it going to be you and, uh, and another family? And so there's maybe eight people. Or maybe you're going to have a, uh, uh, normally when you have the whole family over, it's 20 people or 30 people. And so once you start um, picturing how the yard's going to be used, it's much easier to then design for how that yard's going to be used. Um, before we start diving into the details of what we're going to put into the yard. Then, after considering that and budget, we can start coming up with some ideas. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we, we did uh, the show last episode was on decks and pergolas and the importance of knowing your layout and your plan around how you plan to use that space. And not only for what you plan to do in the immediate future after it's built, but what might be coming in stages. So, for example, if you think, you know, you might want to put a gas barbecue out on your new deck or in your pergola now or in the future, you should make sure you rough in your gas line now. Otherwise, you have a big problem later. And I guess when it comes to landscaping, I'm sure there's certain con considerations like that. Perhaps it's irrigation. Perhaps it's, you know, water supply to a future water feature. What do you think would be kind of those common things to look out for earlier in the, in the planning stages? Um, well, I think it kind of is uh, zone specific. So if we were to say talking about the main area, which I would, which for most yards is going to be the deck or patio or, you know, where you're going to be using the yard the most. So like you said, for the deck, you know, planning a gas line, running a gas line for it. Also a uh, patio heater. Maybe you want to run a patio heater. Maybe there's going to be an an umbrella um, wind. Uh, are you going to deal with the wind? So, for example, we look at a at a patio, stone patio on the ground, uh, versus a a deck. First consideration would be what height should we have that? So sometimes it's advantageous to have a deck that comes right off the door and no steps, um, but that also puts you higher in your yard, which means less privacy from your fence and more exposure to wind. Mm -hmm. So um, patio may be preferable in some, in some situations. So then you'd have maybe a, a, a little landing down to a patio or steps down to a patio. The patio puts you on the ground. So that, uh, then you have more privacy from the fence. You have potentially more uh, less wind exposure by being lower in the yard. Um, so patio versus deck, those are some pros, cons. Then what about shade? If you have a south-facing yard, then your deck patio is probably full sun. And if you like full sun, great, but if you want to sit in the shade, how are you going to achieve some shade? So um, most of the time, I like to consider both because sometimes it's nice to sit in the sun, especially this time of the year when it's not really warm enough to sit in the shade and you want to be in the sun, but in the middle of July, you probably want to sit in the shade versus the sun. So having a bit of both, which can be achieved with, say, uh, strategically planting a tree mm -hmm. semi-middle of the of the patio slash deck. And that way, as the sun crosses over the sky, the, there's going to be part of it that's always shaded and part of it that's always sunny. So you get your choice. Um, another way of achieving that would be with a pergola structure or a, um, a screen. Then the pergola structure can go over top, give you some shade. You can have some screens on the side like little roll down screens that are attached to the pergola that come down and provide uh, additional shade that way. Mm -hmm. So and then going with, uh, with um, size, how big should the patio be? That's kind of more based on how many people you're going to entertain. Um, and then fire, do you want a barbecue? Some people want a full outdoor kitchen with a barbecue and smoker and, um, and et cetera, a uh, fire pit maybe. Uh, some people don't want any of that. So how is that going to lay out? So these uh, these considerations, I guess, are important when, when looking at the design. And Absolutely. Kind of and I think the key probably is not rushing into it, right? Like taking the time to think through. And, you know, if you have somebody like Gord there to help guide you through the design process, you know, he'll raise up those points to consider because, you know, definitely the way you're going to use your your deck or your yard in, you know, in July will be very different than how you're going to use it. Uh, late in September or, or, or in early April. So I think, you know, the strategically planted, planted tree is a great thing to make note of because that can be, uh, it could save you the need to, you know, either 
build the pergola or put up privacy screens, who knows, right? Yeah. Yeah. And just thinking about it in turn, instead of a lot of people come and say, oh, well, I want a 12 by 14 deck, but why and where? So first think of what you're going to do and how you're going to use it and then work backwards as to, you know, what size and where. Yeah, makes sense. I, I'm going to try and show up an image of a, uh, a landscaping plan. So bear with me. This is going to be really clunky and uh, we'll see how it looks. All right, so this is me looking at an image from my other phone in the background. But yeah. it kind of gives you the idea of within a landscape design, um, you know, uh, how you can help to better see the, the plan and the use of space. Um, and here you can see the difference between the hard surfaced areas, you get into some nice plants, I guess there's a grass area there, or maybe that's artificial, I'm not too sure. Um, yeah, so this yard was a you know, relatively small yard, so it didn't have a lot of space. As you can see, the, the door is fairly high with quite a few stairs down. So the stairs were, uh, so you come off of the door flush, there's enough area to have a barbecue and uh, maybe a small table and, and two chairs. And then you go down the stairs onto a fairly large patio that takes up the majority of the yard space. But to keep it a little bit soft, there's a little artificial turf to create some a lawn a little bit of a lawn area with the planting around it. And so the design allows us to, you know, lay out the space and make sure that the, uh, um, that all the furniture and, uh, and it achieves all the goals that the homeowner was looking for. Um, and before we actually start um, building it, but that was kind of the plan here was to maximize the, um, the patio space and the usable area. It was an older couple. They didn't want much maintenance and they wanted to be able to entertain. Nice. Okay. You're right on. Well, at least we know this photo thing kind of works, so I'll be able to show a few along the way. Uh, it's a little, a little clunky, no doubt, but it will suffice. Um, so in relation to the plan, I guess, of attack for your landscaping project, let's talk a little bit about the permitting process and, you know, when are permits necessary when it comes to landscaping and are they? And, um, you know, I guess we talk, I know for decks and anything attached to the home, there's some, certainly some regulation there, but uh, what do you typically run into on your end? Um, so definitely always check your local building codes first, because it does vary by uh, from town to town, like uh, Sherwood Park is different than St. Albert. Um, but in general, if it's, a, if it's a new home or an infill home, you need to have final grading approval, which means getting a surveyor up and approve the grading of the lot. That's usually the first thing on, uh, on for a new home, not generally required for an existing home, unless you have some sort of an issue, but fairly rare on an existing home. Uh, then some cities like city of Edmonton do require a screen permit. If you're going to put up a, a screen, uh, the, uh, um, which is anything that's taller than six feet or taller than your fence. Um, hot tub permit, electrical permit, gas permit are, are all ones if you're putting in electrical or gas or, um, or hot tub ponds or pools for a uh, for fish or a water feature. Um, they need a permit if they're more than two feet deep. If they're less than two feet deep and they don't need a permit uh, in most places. The, uh, the fence, so long as the fence is to code, you don't need a permit for the fence. Um, and otherwise, Retaining walls generally don't need a permit. Some counties do require a permit over a meter, like St. Albert requires a permit for walls over a meter, but most of the other um, cities and counties don't. Uh, in general, most landscaping doesn't require much permits. However, the one thing I would note you should always do with landscaping is get uh, utilities located so that you don't hit something unexpected when you're in the ground. Absolutely. Like gas lines that some gas lines are only buried a few inches deep, which is not to code, but you also don't want to be the one to find that out the wrong way. Um, and yeah, so it's free to do, it takes a little bit of pre-planning, but uh, for safety, always get those utilities located. Yeah, no doubt. Um, yeah, what about drainage? Like I know that you need to, um, with new builds and infill, you know, they that, um, that's a consideration, but do you see that coming up at all now is within, you know, existing houses where you're doing a renovation or, or landscaping work? 
Is that just kind of up to the contractor to address that, or is there something that the, the city does to help ensure that we have got uh, adequate drainage? Um, so it is the homeowner's responsibility to maintain proper drainage away from their home. So when doing a final grade uh, on a new home or an infill home, it is checked and approved by the city, but otherwise, and thereafter, it's on the, the home. It is the homeowner's re responsibility, and it is kind of your first line of defense to keep the water out of the house. You know, it's a, the house is made with a solid concrete foundation and no doubt can handle lots of water, but you don't want it to have to. So by draining, uh, by maintaining a positive grade away from the house is definitely a priority and should be maintained. So a couple of things to watch out for. Um, it is common for settling to occur around a home, um, mm -hmm. especially a new home. In the first several years, you know, you can expect some some settling within that first meter around the perimeter of the house which is because that area was excavated when they built the house in order to accommodate the the room needed for the forms and stuff for the foundation walls so that first meter which is also the most important part of keeping water away from your house is the part that's most likely to settle oh, yeah, so you definitely yeah. want to make sure that that grade doesn't go negative or slope towards your house foundation so it should slope away yeah, Another we see that a lot, and especially when they put sidewalks in. If they haven't pinned them to the foundation, or they don't have brackets, or there's no piles underneath them, you'll see those sidewalk settles, and you end up with this nice new sidewalk that's sloping towards the house, which is not helping you in any way. Um, well, that, that would be a, that's actually a, one of the concerns. So sometimes they'll they'll mount like your concrete steps to the home or the sidewalk to the home, but the ground can still settle which is, which, the, you know, the pinning it to the house is great because it makes it easy to fix, but you still have to fix it. If you have a giant hole under your front stairs, even though your stairs never move because they're pinned solidly to the house, water goes downhill. And mm -hmm. if there's a giant hole under those stairs, that's where the water is going to collect, which is right next to your foundation. Yeah. Um, so uh, for concrete, always, always make sure that the ground under the concrete is also sloping away from your home so if you see that settlement there that's important another one that i would that i kind of point out to people that that a lot of people don't realize is window wells um window wells are below grade and they have a drain pipe or a, generally a weeping tile that's in the middle of them that drains the water down to the uh, to the weeping tile that goes around the house but that drain is quite critical because if you have sheeting water coming into the window well it's escaping through that drain. And then I've had the unfortunate experience of going to, uh, to several homes when they had flooding because their window well filled up mm -hmm. and then the water poured in through the window. And uh, I know one situation, that, uh, his window well was right close to his uh, door. He threw his garbage bags in there while he was waiting for garbage day because it kind of kept them out of sight. But a large plastic bag makes a great little dam and that's what had happened is the, uh, um, the plastic sealed off the drain so that the water wasn't able to drain and filled up. So I suggest every spring, check your window wells and make sure they're clean, free of debris, and the water can drain out the way it's supposed to. Absolutely. We've actually seen something similar that was a result of the eaves trough being plugged directly over top of a window well. And so we got a torrential downpour and all this water rushed, just drip drained over the edge of the eaves trough, right into the window well. Um, it, this house didn't have weeping tile. So it, it just kind of backfilled and backfilled until it came in the window and yeah, they had a major issue in their basement. So, um, you know, uh, as important as a good plan is good ongoing maintenance and checking around your house to make sure that, um, you know, it's still set up um, properly and, and operating the way it needs to. So, okay, I'm gonna yeah. try to flip this camera again. All right. This is my picture of the <laughs> segue into talking about irrigation. So, so irrigation is actually uh, great from a water use perspective because um, it waters the right amount. So a lot of the problem is if you if you don't water enough, then of course your lawn uh, tends to not look as nice as you wanted it to, and if you water too much, you're wasting water. Mm -hmm. So uh, an irrigation system is kind of time to use just the right amount of water. Uh, and so typically an automatic irrigation system 
will be set up with different zones or different areas that get watered at once. It's not the whole yard getting watered at the same time. It's one particular area at a time. And so one zone will do, say, the shaded part of the yard, and another zone will do the sunny part of the yard so that the sunny part gets a little bit more water. Um, and then the, uh, the system comes on automatically with a timer, so it usually comes on at night or, say, 2, 3 in the morning when there's full water pressure. Nobody's, most people aren't having a shower then and such. Plus, there's no evapor not lost to evaporation because the sun's not up yet, so you don't lose any water to the evaporation. Um, plus, it has a chance to soak in a little into the ground a little bit before the sun comes up. And then there's also typically a, a rain sensor. That's a little sensor that sits on your uh, on a fence post or something and just measures the rainfall. And if there's enough rain to trip the sensor, then the irrigation system will skip its next cycle. So it works quite well that way to to maintain the your yard and it makes it possible to have a little nicer lawn and uh, plants growing a little better without having to uh, water it uh, yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I tell you, this is a tricky way to show pictures. I'm trying to scroll in the background and, and put some stuff up here. But uh, here's another one, which just basically addresses drainage and. Um, you know, I guess that's something to know, I suppose, within your grading of your yard. If you you have a low spot or uh, or some way that you want to get water out off site quickly. I mean, how often are you, are you putting in systems like this to help and, you know, mitigate? Um, so this is a, um, a trench drain or often called a French drain. And it's a drain of last resort. It's very, it's a, it's an okay system, but it's um, it's the worst way to drain a yard. The worst way is it basically you always would prefer to have a swale or essentially a slight mm -hmm. depression trench that drains the water away. Um, and those work the best. If you can't do that, this is kind of an alternative. So it gives you a way to get rid of the water when you can't have surf proper surface drainage. The reason why you don't want to go this way is your first option is because it's subsurface or under the ground. And so that pipe right now, um, as the snow melts, the ground is still frozen. So as the snow is melting, that water has to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. Goes into that pipe, that pipe will still be frozen because the ground is frozen. So these systems don't work in the spring. So while it does work well the rest of the year, there's a, a critical two to four weeks in the spring thaw that you often have to go with like a pump and manually pump away that water because you can't rely on this system to work during that time. Well, you better make sure you don't plan a vacation during that two or three week period of the spring then. Yeah. Because again, that becomes a high maintenance, um, you know, aspect of that type of drainage system. Yeah, a lot of people think of a French drain as a, as a good option, but it's really, it's really an option of last resort. It works, but it's not the best. Just get proper surface drainage and you'll have far less problems. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the swale was probably the best way to address it. And it can make a nice little feature in the yard. I'm trying to pick, find a couple of pictures I can show here where we've got them. Uh, bear with me here. But uh, if you don't know what a swale is, basically it just kind of creates a little bit of a valley and a controlled direction to allow for means of escape for the water from your yard. <laughs> Yeah, a little depression in the swale. Uh, some people can refer to it as a ditch. And um, and then the ditch or swale can be hidden with a dry creek or using like different sized and colored rocks to make it look attractive and like a yard feature as well. Absolutely. All right, we've got a couple of good pictures of it. I'm just trying to find them here. Um, another, uh, another good consideration, especially for for yards that are uh, somewhat flat. So you see this uh, particularly in um, the, uh, the more mature neighborhoods of, of Edmonton. I mean, um, back from those neighborhoods, uh, depending on how far back you go, uh, yeah, you, you can have situations like that where the water just seems to sit and there's not enough uh, um, drainage uh, or slope away to, to effectively drain the water away. Um, but it's a sitting away from the house, you know, it's not really causing a problem other than the ground just always seems wet. And uh, so the 
best ways of dealing with that is to drain it, put a swale in. But of course, if there's not enough slope or it's not very efficient to put a swale in, the next best option is to use uh, plants. Mm -hmm. So like a nice tree, uh, like a laurel leaf willow it will be excellent at it. Um, or some shrubs, they'll drink that water away so that you don't have um, a marshy area in your yard. Yeah, that's a great point. Absolutely. Yeah. This is not what I was looking for exactly, but it kind of gives you an idea of, um, you know, a way that you could potentially hide some drainage. Yeah, water flows quite easily through rocks. So using rocks to hide a, a swale or a, or a bit of a ditch or drainage area is generally quite effective at um, being able to both drain the water yet still look flat to the eye because the rocks are taking up that depression. Absolutely. Um, let's talk a bit about water features for a second here. And I got some good photos I want to show. Let's bear with me while I pull them up. But what are some considerations, like if somebody knows they want to hear, and I guess the, I'll back up here. Some people want water features for different reasons. Some people want to hear the sound of water running. It's very calming. Others want to see a body of water, whether it be a pond or maybe a little creek. Others want to have possibly fish in their yard. Um, and what are some of those things to consider and where do you typically start with someone when they want a water feature included in their landscaping? So water feature, we kind of divide them into three. Um, so you can have like a, a fountain or like a rock bubbler or a traditional concrete water fountain. Um, then you can have a pond, like you see in the photo here. This one was a fairly large pond. Um, and so you have a body of water where you can put fish in, and see the water. And then you have a waterfall, which is often combined with a pond, but doesn't need to be. And you have a waterfall where the water falls and then it can just disappear and recirculate into the, into the rocks. So between those, those three, the fountain's obviously the cheapest and easiest, but gives you the sound of water. Um, mm -hmm. Not too much of the look, though, because it's, it's relatively small. The water feature gives you an amazing look and, and the um, sound. And then the pond, of course, gives you the standing water. So you have the, the, uh, a waterfall as it comes, or comes down. Mm -hmm. So with a, with a pond, um, fish or no fish, uh, generally speaking, if you're going to have if you're going to make it for fish, uh, for something like koi or something, that's kind of a hobbyist. That's a fair bit of work. And uh, koi, most koi fish will outlive humans. They live for a long time, and so they're kind of a lifelong commitment. Uh, so if you're not uh, going to get into the hobby of growing those fish, you probably <laughs> want to avoid that. Um, you know, that's that's good to know. I didn't realize koi's had such a, a long lifespan. So Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting hobby. I mean, you can grow koi for their for their color and um, uh, an amazing colored koi fish will sell for a million dollars so they're they're definitely a certain um, look to them and uh, a certain a certain hobbyist but after that you have the uh, the waterfall which when you're building the waterfall you can actually um, you you can change the look by how far the water is falling, but you can also change the noise. Um, two different ways, the volume of water, which is obvious, but less obvious is the tone of the sound. So when water falls directly onto the rocks, like you see in this picture, it'll make a higher pitch tone that's closer to um, the voice of people speaking. And so you can't make it as loud when it's splashing off of rocks because it'll drown out your voice as you sit next to it. So it needs, you can't put as much volume through it and still be able to talk normally while you're close to it. On the flip side, when you have the water fall into water, so you create little pools where the water is going to fall into, it deepens the sound uh, that the water makes and puts it out of the tone that people speak. And so you can have it much louder like this um, you can have it much water, louder, so a lot more volume of water going through it without, and still be able to speak in a normal voice next to it just by changing the, um, the tone that the water um, sound is making makes it so that you're, you can still talk comfortably next to it and have a louder sound. I just want to say for the record, I had no idea about the tone of the sound of the water hitting, <laughs> whether it be rock or water, and I think that's you know, exactly tease up the home run as to why it's important to talk to an expert in their field, right? So 
Um, for anybody who's tuning in, this is the Art of Renovation Live. I'm your host, Paul Foster. I have Gord from um, Green Tree Outdoor Living here. He's a master um, landscape designer, and he just enlightened us as to what the sound of water, uh, how that can impact um, what you hear, depending on how it's how it's reflecting off of water or rock. So there you go. Um, okay, so water features. What's maintenance like on these things? I mean, you can't run them all year long, or can you? What What do you What do you have to say about that? Um, generally speaking, no. Uh, to the hobbyist with the koi pond, there's ways of doing it, but uh, in general, no. Wait, okay, they, wait. Then where Where do the koi fish go come winter? In a tank inside, I presume. Most people run a tank inside. Although we have done a couple for people who keep them outside year round, and you know, you you make the water deeper, you aerate it and heat it slightly, and um, you can make it work outside. Uh, so, but that's that's getting into kind of a specialty thing. So, in for the most for the average person, you don't really want to uh, run it year round. Um, maintenance is actually pretty low. Uh, the, the highest maintenance is when you go to the pond. So uh, a fountain or a waterfall is relatively low maintenance because um, you don't need as clear of water. The water is always splashing and moving around. So it being very clear isn't as important. And so we actually use this little $200 Japanese rock um, to keep your water clear. It's kind of, it's quite, uh, it's pretty cool. It's just a little rock double the size of your fist you put it in the water and it um, for a typical fountain or waterfall it'll last uh, three to five years uh, before you replace it and it simply encourages uh, algae growth it's actually funny this fellow came to me to to sell this rock um, and he gave uh, I was pretty skeptical at first so he gave me a few of them we put them in on a few ponds and the next year they were all fine. They didn't have algae growth and it works great. So it's a very simple way of, uh, of keeping the water clear. You just throw this rock in, the algae, um, the, the bacteria grows that eats the algae and creates its own little ecosystem to keep the water clear without really having to do much to it. So for a typical fountain or um, waterfall rock bubbler, it's pretty much a once a year thing. You know, take the pump out in the fall, put it in the garage or whatever. And then in the spring is your big to-do. So in the spring, spray wash it all off, clean it all up, pump out the dirty water, fill it up with clean water, put the pump back in, get it going. That's your kind of big once a year maintenance. Mm -hmm. um, for a pond though, you do need to, typically need to do a little extra. So running it through a filter, um, emptying out the leaves as the leaves fall in the fall, uh, controlling your, your uh, um, you, you can still do it all organically using um, bacteria, but you need to put in a, like a biome or um, an area that has a bunch of lava rock or something where the bacteria can culture and grow to uh, handle the, the algae and keeps the water a little clearer. And then uh, um, if you're going to go with fish and stuff too, then you need to start looking at a sand filter or something to, to make sure you're really filtering that water. So uh, a pond can be a little bit more maintenance from that respect. Um, waterfalls, fountains, rock bubblers, these are all pretty low maintenance, so, yeah. Interesting. Lots to consider for sure, and uh, pretty amazing how nature always finds its way to to help preserve. Um, so there you go. Now um, let's move on to other features in the yard, and I got a picture from one of your projects here that um, shows you kind of other things you can do to make your yard, you know, both attractive and entertaining. Tell us a bit about this project. Um, so putting green obviously is, uh, can be fun for the kids to play, but also work on your, on your golf game. So putting in a putting green, it's generally with artificial turf. Uh, so it's fairly expensive, um, to put in, uh, artificial turf is kind of built like a patio or like a concrete walkway, um, almost the same except for the top concrete. So you put in a solid base and that's what you lay the artificial turf on, um, which does make it a little bit more expensive but it makes it very low maintenance once you have it. Um, plus the, uh, when you're considering that, you don't need the putting green to be very large. You know, like here you could, you can chip from the lawn over on the other side of the walkway to practice your chipping game. And then of course the putting game, you can 
go down to the putting green and, and play around back and forth that way. So if you are interested in a, in a putting green, I normally suggest, you know, go fairly small because it, it, it is kind of a bit pricey. And, but put it somewhere where you can stand back and, you know, chip as well. So you get that part of your game um, in there as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the putting alone might, you know, might not keep you entertained long enough. Here's a little diagram, I guess, of what it takes to prep for artificial turf. Um, this is not from your website, but um, does this look accurate for our climate here too? Uh, yeah, although there's usually just the one foam instead of the two, but um, the foam is what creates the softness because you're essentially creating a, a, a solid um, con um, gravel foundation that's a hard surface. And then you're making it soft again with the, uh, with the little bit of foam, mm -hmm. um, which is actually important because the, the turf isn't, uh, isn't all that strong to hold your weight. If you were to imagine, you know, putting a piece of paper in mud and then poking it with your finger, your finger will poke right through it. Mm -hmm. But go take that same piece of uh, paper, lay it on your countertop, and then hit it with your punch it with your fist as hard as you can, and you won't get a hole in the uh, paper. And it's because of the substrate that you're putting it on. So same idea with the turf. You need a solid foundation so that when you're stepping on it, running around it, jumping on it, it's not getting destroyed because it's on a solid foundation. And that's the theory behind it. Yeah, it makes makes total sense. Um, I have artificial turf in my backyard, which came with the house when we bought it. At first, I was kind of, you know, wasn't sure what I thought about it. Figured I prefer having a, a regular sod uh, in the backyard, and I have a large dog, and I have young kids, and I quickly realized the the value of having the artificial turf in the yard because in my former yard, my dog killed the grass just by going to the bathroom everywhere, and um, you know, the kids were rough on it, and it became kind of a you know a very unattractive yard at some point along the way. So the artificial turf now is a different type of maintenance I have to do. I have to pressure wash it every now and then, make sure I rinse it. I, I actually will hit it with a push broom, like just to kind of clean stuff out of the turf surface. And, you know, with the dog peeing out all the time, it's, I kind of want to flush it out regularly. It doesn't seem to naturally drain the way that a regular lawn would have. Um, what are your thoughts on that as far as maintenance on the artificial turf? Yeah, and like, well, like everything, there's no such thing as no maintenance. There's only uh, right. maintenance. So artificial turf is definitely low maintenance, but not zero. So I, I normally suggest um, using a leaf blower, um, and you can blow off the leaves and debris that gets onto the, uh, onto the turf is the easiest way to do it. Um, and then brushing it, like you said, once or twice a year, um, brushing it. So in the turf, there's a, there's a little layer of sand that sits over top of the, uh, over top of the mat and in between the bristles or the little spikes of, of lawn sticking up. And that sand is what's keeping the blades of grass upright as, if, as you were. So sweeping it, you're kind of rejiggling that, uh, that sand to go in between the blades of grass nicely, which keep, gets them all back vertical. And that's how you get rid of the, uh, the grass, like if you, where you stepped on it and et cetera. Mm -hmm. So brushing it, uh, brushing it at least once a year would be um, definitely advantageous. And then um, washing it, uh, you should wash it off at least once a year, like you would your patio or driveway kind of thing. Um, if you, however, if you have dogs, then more often as appropriate, depending on how much your dog uses it. However, the, the, one of the biggest advantages and most of the time when, when someone goes all artificial turf in a yard, it's either because it's a very small yard, so the cost isn't um, overly difficult to manage compared to the cost of owning a lawnmower and et cetera, or it's a yard where they have dogs and mm -hmm. they want to be able to let their dogs run around in the yard and enjoy it, but also don't want a bunch of dead patches in their lawn. So, Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, like anything, it's just a matter of it all takes some level of maintenance, right? And I, for me, having to rinse and spray and brush and pressure wash my <laughs> artificial turf um, is a lot easier than me trying to, like, replant sod and deal with the maintenance of, you know, 
uh, a yard that a dog has basically destroyed. It's also the kind of maintenance that, you know, you do when you want, when you have time. You know, you go right. away for three weeks on vacation. You don't do it during that time. You do it when you get back. Whereas lawn, it's continuous steady every week, no matter what. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is this the same? I had a picture on the show. Is that the same project we looked at for that, to that top view previously? It is, yeah, just from a yeah. different angle. Yeah, so you can see, I mean, for chipping, you're right. You're up on that higher elevation there. You could... Uh, yeah, you can do a short chip from the lower elevation or further away from the top one, which, you know, definitely allows you to practice a few different short game shots. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, beautiful yard, absolutely. Um, for anybody tuning in, uh, this is the Art of Renovation Live. I'm your host, Paul Foster from Contact Renovation and Custom Homes, and we're talking about landscape design this week. I have uh, Gord here from Green Tree Outdoor Living. He's a master landscape designer. And we're going to start talking about retaining walls and what your options are there. And we'll go back to this image here. And you can see we have this concrete retaining wall. And it certainly is, uh, is an option. Um, what are your thoughts generally as far as when you design a retaining wall? Is it mostly an aesthetic consideration? Um, obviously, there's some price points to consider to uh, maybe access as far as how you're going to get material in there, whether in this case, you know, you need a concrete pump truck to get it over the house, et cetera, et cetera. Um, where do you typically start when it comes time to plan a retaining wall? Um, so could, first of all, retaining walls are expensive, especially for for their size. So quite often it's, but it's most advantageous to avoid a retaining wall if possible, which I would uh, strongly recommend anybody looking at buying a house or uh, uh, is something they consider Retaining walls are a huge amount of money, and I've seen many a times where somebody walks into a lot and buys a house and is like, oh, this one's great, it's awesome, and the backyard is like this, and there's no usable space without a retaining wall, and they didn't realize that a retaining wall is going to cost 50 grand or mm -hmm. some crazy number that wasn't factored into that. So if you're looking at buying another house and it's going to need a retaining wall, um, definitely budget for that. You don't want to be left with that because you can't afford to replace it, as you see in that photo. Um, right. So, once, however, on the flip side, uh, retaining walls give you a huge potential. I mean, you can make it look great. You can have the different tiers to the yard. You can have a waterfall coming down the slope. You can. There's a lot of potential you can do with the retaining with the sloped yard and uh, using the retaining walls to to create, you know, both an amazing landscape and uh, and create art. Um, architectural features that you couldn't do without the slope. Um, so the retaining wall can be built out of uh, concrete, as you saw in that one photo, it could be built out of wood, um, uh, also boulders or large rocks. A segmented retaining wall like here where it's a, a concrete block stacked up. Uh, so these uh, retaining walls are kind of uh, both budget and, uh, and aesthetic. So from a budget perspective, you usually want to go with either poured concrete or wood for the retaining walls. Um, from an aesthetic view, the segmented concrete blocks like you saw there or like the natural boulders um, where you use real boulders and stack them up to create retaining walls is generally more expensive but uh, often more aesthetic uh, fits the bill. Mm -hmm. um, Just looking for so the, here. Um, we got a question here. Come in from uh, Jen Bergmanski. Uh, what's the name of that rock you put in the fountain to help with algae? An eco bio block. Eco bio block? Yeah, uh, ECO dash BIO. Um, At the end of the uh, comments here. Eco bio. Is that available locally? Uh, pretty sure you can buy it on Amazon. Definitely online somewhere. Um, research. Yeah. Uh, Google that and you'll you'll find somewhere to buy it and I believe you can buy it from Amazon actually. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good to know. Um, boy, this is painful trying to find photos this way. Let me tell you, I really wish that uh, we could still do this the normal way. But anyhow, here's another. Took me a while to find it, but here's another one that we've got a uh, retaining wall built out of big, large. I'm assuming that's chunks yeah. of what is that? So that that's all boulders, uh, real boulder walls. 
Um, one thing to point out with boulders, a lot of people, a lot, of, quite a number of people, um, think of boulder retaining walls as cheap uh, or less expensive, but they really aren't. Um, it takes a little bit more time to do, and the boulders are fairly expensive. And one thing that I would point out is if you're looking at a boulder wall, um, the boulders need to be fairly square, like you see in that photo, how they're relatively flat on the top and bottom. And they, those types of boulders actually cost more. They quarry wherever the boulders come from. I mean, they know this. So they literally will create two piles, one that has all the nice square boulders, and they charge one price for those ones. And then all the ones that aren't square, they go into another pile, and they have a totally different price. Mm. So if you're thinking of that price for your boulder wall, uh, you're going to have a hard time building that wall and make it look nice. You need the square boulders, which, as the quarry knows, uh, are going to be more expensive. Yeah, well, that's good. Good to know. I know I got a couple boulders. Uh, I like to look at the square ones. So I got a couple dropped off at my house just for decoration in the front yard. I put my uh, house address feature on one of them, and... Um, I got them at a special price and I was still pretty shocked as to the, the cost of them. And actually more than the cost of the actual boulder itself was the delivery, right? Because this was not something that, you know, two guys threw it in their pickup truck. You know, obviously we needed a forklift to get it up into the back of a, you know, uh, a low boy trailer. And then from there, we brought it to site, needed the forklift again to get it off the truck, off the trailer and into its position. So um, yeah, just general logistics, I mean, a lot of people think of a boulder as 20 bucks and, and yeah, they probably are if you can go get it, but, um, you know, the, to go and get it, how are you going to throw it on the back of your pickup truck without it destroying your pickup truck? Yeah, the semi trucks have actually the exact same problem. Uh, you can't ship those great big boulders like you would other gravel in, um, I mean, most gravel is hauled in these very efficient trucks that have lots of wheels and are built very light with aluminum boxes. Well, you can't transport giant boulders that way. So you're using mm -hmm. a more expensive truck that can haul less. And um, yeah, it just becomes more expensive all the way around because of their size um, and weight. And that's often what you're paying for is uh, mm -hmm. the transportation cost of getting that boulder of whatever color it is from where, where that color of boulder comes from to Edmonton. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, we should probably address the logistical costs associated with the project too, because, you know, we do some, some renovations where we need to access the backyard and there's no laneway. Um, some houses don't have any rear access, which poses a real challenge for us, uh, you know, depending on what you need back there. So you can imagine you want to make a larger retaining wall um, and you don't have any access direct to the backyard um, other than maybe a three foot um, side setback on your property. Well, that really limits what we can do as far as getting large or heavy material to the backyard. And sometimes we're running a crane over the house then to deliver things, which, um, you know, really can impact uh, the construction cost. Yes, there's definitely always uh, an order of events to make the construction most, of, most efficient, um, depending on where your access is coming from. Uh, fortunately, they make all kinds of machines that... Uh, um, that are different sizes and so we can almost always get some kind of machine into a yard but the smaller machine is less efficient not as quick and etc um, but yes yeah when you're considering things like boulder walls or water features or things that require um, you know stuff to to be moved by machine and not by hand those generally need to be done first um, so that there's still full access absolutely um, another uh, thing with retaining walls are, I guess, retaining walls and drainage that I would point out, um, particularly because I was just at a client's house this morning to deal with this issue. But uh, um, yeah, there's a big problem with subsurface water. And this is a, a biggest, you see this problem the most on walkout, on homes that have a walkout basement, especially when they back on to a dry pond or, or pond or uh, etc. And uh, the, the issue is that you can have proper surface drainage uh, where the water can slope away from the house nice and it drains properly and etc. But you still have subsurface water. So what that means, because you're backing onto a dry pond, the whole subdivision behind in front of your house that's all graded towards that dry pond, uh, even though the surface water 
gets taken away by the city storm drains and um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, the subsurface water is coming straight through your yard. And if you think of that as an underground river, I mean, obviously it's, it's not like a flowing river with amounts of water that you could, um, that are going to be flowing at any kind of speed, but it's a slow trickle of water that mm -hmm. it goes under the surface. And this can affect a lot of things like moving your piles around for your deck. And now your deck is doing this or your lower patio and breaks up concrete and breaks up um, patio makes a, a wave in your, in your paving stone or cracks your concrete and moves it. Um, so dealing with the subsurface water, especially on a walkout basement home, uh, one, uh, one of the tricks there is to use, uh, um, basically make a, a soil cement. So if you think of concrete, concrete's made out of, uh, of a few things. One of the main ingredients being a cement powder. Um, you can buy that cement powder from like Home Depot. It's called Portland cement. Uh, it's 25 bucks a bag or something. And using that and mixing it into the soil under your patio or, or walkway or whichever will substantially reduce that soil's ability to retain water and will help substantially on uh, your patio moving around due to the subsurface water, um, which is, yeah. I just dealt with a client uh, this morning who's spending probably twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars on redoing his uh, patio and walkway from a few years ago because the original landscaper didn't consider the subsurface drainage. And uh, I wouldn't say he did a bad job; uh, it was all graded properly and et cetera, et cetera. And had it not have been a walkout basement onto a pond, it probably would have all been fine. But um, yeah, the subsurface water creates a lot of moisture under the patio, that freeze thaw moves it around and parts of it had moved by like a foot on his, uh, on his patio. So, yeah. The yeah, other consideration would be if you, if you back on somewhere, you have a really high water table and you're around your home too, it'd be, you know, you make sure your sump pump is, is operating properly. Cause we've seen houses before too, where that sump is just working 24 seven to get water out from around the foundation. And it's just because, you know, where the water table is and, water is moving around underneath the house and it's something to certainly, you know, to mitigate. So, um, again, maintenance, stay on top of your sump pump for sure. Um, let's talk a bit about, um, paving stones. Oh, my setup moved a little bit here. Bear with me. My archaic setup here to try and make this work. So a paving bit. stone, great, great patio. So we have, um, uh, stone decking that we can put at any height. So we can actually cover a stone decking, like your cover your wood deck with a stone, a second story deck, cover the stairs, and then cover the ground directly on the ground. Um, so in this application, it's uh, on the ground. So you essentially make a, 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 a base for it, uh, usually with a road crush or gravel base that's then compacted and leveled off nicely with the stone on top which uh, is great. It's, um, I often think of or describe this as a feeling. Um, when, you have a, when you have a deck, you're raised up. It's especially great if you back onto like that pond because you're overlooking the pond, great view and etc. cetera. But when you're, uh, when you're using a yard or when you're going to use your outdoor yard space, it has a, very, it has a certain feeling. Um, I describe it like, you know, you come home, you're you know, going to go have a glass of wine or grab a beer from the fridge. And as you're pulling that beer out, you, something's got to click. You're either going to just go and sit on the couch in front of the TV, or you know what, I'm going to go sit outside and you want to go sit outside because it's, it's relaxing. It's nice and sunny out. It's, uh, maybe you're a little bit crazy like me and it's a, a thunderstorm and you want to uh, watch the thunderstorm go by uh, or whichever the case may be but something's got to pull you outside to get you out there and then that feeling you have outside I mean yes you could just go sit on the couch um, the couch is a very comfortable chair uh, from an all practical standpoint that's the perfect place to go sit but outside is different and uh, having that patio to sit on versus a deck gives you a little more of a grounded feeling where you're sitting in the ground or in nature or on, on the ground. Uh, and the way I describe that is if you've ever been to, you know, your kid's uh, 
um, school function where they had a dinner set up in the gym. And it's one of those gyms where it has the stage section and they put a few more tables up on the stage. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you were the one of the guys sitting on that stage versus on the ground, it's a totally different feeling. Um, because you, you know, you're practically speaking, there's no difference. You're just sitting around another round table with the other people you're sitting at that table with. What's the difference? But it feels different because you're raised up on that stage. So same thing when you have a patio on the ground, you're down into nature. You have a grounded feeling um, versus being up or raised up. Absolutely. Now let's show this picture again. And again, it's not, um, you know, more of the ideas. Look, if you've, I like what you said before about you need to be drawn outside. And if you have just a flat yard, and I mean, in this case, this is before landscaping, or at least it's, or maybe it's just terribly maintained. But you can imagine afterwards, you know, you'll want to go outside and enjoy the space, this image at the bottom, right? And it's, that's, it looks like a relatively small yard, but there's lots of little details there, maybe a little bit um, compact on the green space there. But, you know, I think the point is, you're right, you know, what, what can draw you outside to enjoy your yard, which I think is a big part of what, where we're all at now with having been stuck at home so much for so long, I think people are, are getting out there more often and we get a lot of calls about doing yard projects now and, and uh, you know, it's a matter of doing the design in a way that you want to go out and spend time with your family and your friends in your yard. And I, I would agree, like um, really think about how you're going to use the space and you know, maybe you have something designed down, down at ground level. You have something that's tiered up a little bit higher. It depends on how you plan to use it. Yeah, a few particular notes on that. Um, something to draw you outside could be a water feature, the sound of water. Uh, could be a cool um, shrub or uh, an interesting tree. Could be like a little glass ornament that twinkles and hanging in the tree. Uh, having a space to sit that's on the ground in a patio. Uh, that can be shaded or sun, depending on the weather. Uh, planting, having some trees, especially trees particularly uh, strategically located to hide like your neighbor's windows. You don't feel like you're being looked down on uh, mm -hmm. or people looking down into your yard while you're sitting there enjoying it. So some tr strategically placed trees. And then overall cleanliness, uh, often called curb appeal or um, you know, clean edges. Uh, basically, when you're sitting there, you don't want to be looking at a yard that, oh, I need to do this. Oh, well, I, yeah, I got to take care of that. Oh, man, yeah. As soon as you start thinking about these issues or problems or things you have to do in the yard, the relaxation feeling goes away. <laughs> so uh, making sure your yard is, is uh, has the amount of, I mean, there's no such thing as no maintenance. Um, but has an amount of maintenance that you're comfortable with um, so that you're not feeling overwhelmed with the amount of maintenance you have to do to keep your yard looking that perfect so that when you're sitting out there, you're enjoying the space, not worried about what else you have to do or what you have to do next in your yard. Absolutely. That's a great point. You know, I think that as a, as a contractor, you know, I run into that challenge in my home sometimes is that, you know, we do renovation projects all day long here. It's always like a top of mind for me and I get home and, and I look around my house and there's so much I'd love to do with my home. And it's always an ongoing battle for me not to want to just start another project at home because of something I was maybe inspired by from a client's project or I'm excited about. I see the potential of my home and it can easily become a little bit of an ongoing work list for me. So I've gotten much better in my senior years here about relaxing a bit at home and understanding, look, it's not all going to be perfect immediately, but I think you need to be realistic about what you can accomplish. And same applies for your landscape design. Make sure you don't bite off more than you can chew because if you get a high maintenance setup in the end that you're not prepared to maintain on an ongoing basis and you're not comfortable paying to have somebody maintain it for you, you might have just put yourself in a bit of a, back yourself into a bit of a corner. So anyhow, um, Gord, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Really appreciate you sharing your expertise. Usually right now I'll be sharing a slide that shows all of Gord's contact details, but... Um, thanks to Instagram and then how they change their features, I cannot display it. But we will share them in our stories later. Uh, if you have any questions about landscaping projects, please do reach out to Gord, um, Green Tree Outdoor Living. They have a great showroom down on um, uh, Calgary Trail. 
just off of what's the um what's the avenue it intersects with again uh so it's uh two blocks south of argyle on calgary trail southbound um so five nine two five one oh four street but yeah two blocks south of of uh argyle on calgary trail southbound i'll put my uh uh the phone number in the comments here too it sounds awesome well thanks again uh, thanks, everyone, who tuned in. Uh, this has been the Art of Renovation Live. I'm your host, Paul Foster, Contact Renovations and Custom Homes. Today's show is about landscape design. Um, specific questions about landscaping. Do you reach out to Green Tree directly? Uh, you have a bigger project in mind with many moving pieces, and you need someone to help quarterback the activities. That's where someone like me would come in. So thanks again. Uh, thanks again, Gord. Take care, everyone. Yes, thank, you, thank you. Appreciate it. All right. We'll uh, be back in a couple of weeks. Uh, with a new topic. Stay tuned. Bye-bye.